good morning or good afternoon. My name is Maurice Martin, and I'm one of the presenters today. I want to welcome you to the National Veterans for Peace virtual uh, convention. We're very excited that you are able to join us. And um, we're sorry we can't meet together uh, this year, but we're going to do the best that we can to keep our uh, contact with our veterans here. Um, I'm, you have arrived at the National Veterans for Peace National Project, the Homeless Veterans Working Group. This working group has been together since 2010. Um, Jack Dossie is the co-chair, and myself is co uh, as, uh, uh, also, Maurice Martin is also co-chair. With me today as presenter, it will be Dave Dittimore. But in the audience will be our co-chair and, and chief, uh, Jack Dossie, and also one of our uh, member leaders, uh, Dolores Donovan. They will be here today, be helping us answer questions during our Q&A session uh, after Dave and I do our quick presentation. So I want to tell you a little bit about the Homeless Veteran Working Group is that we have uh, been together since 2010. Uh, we have been, we, joined, we started this group because we recognize our own, uh, many of us have been working out on the streets with homeless issues for, uh, for a long time. And we began to see that this was unacceptable to us to see our brothers and sisters existing out on the street with little support and help. So um, in 2010, Jack and I got together and formed this, uh, this group to start addressing that issue. We were in crisis then. Now, we, with the coronavirus, we have supersized it, and we have gone from being in crisis to being in danger. Our ultimate goal in our homeless veteran working group, of course, is to make sure that we find accessible and affordable housing for all veterans. Not only do they deserve it, they've earned that right. So we want to try to make sure they have access to services and programs, whether they be come from the LGBT community, the LGBTQ community, the transgender community, uh, veterans, single veterans, single women, or veteran women with children and those who, um, um, who have been, those who have struggled with uh, mental health issues, those struggling with sexual abuse or sexual trauma, traumatic brain injury, uh, alcoholism, uh, suicide uh, addiction. We all want to try to bring those people home because we learned that addressing none of those issues is sustainable without the least bit of accessible and affordable housing. But our group is more about, our group is about education. Our group is about training. Our group is about getting our population and doing an outreach to our veterans. The question is, is not, we cannot expect all our homeless veterans with all the various issues that they have to come to the VA hospital. It is important for us when the VA is, um, for like underserved, un understaffed, underfunded, it falls upon us to leave no veteran behind and to reach out, to reach homeless veterans where they are, to give them information, pass information about the VA and how they get their cards and so forth, or provide water and or food. So the, the first thing with our group is that we want to make first contact. That first contact is um, find out what's going on in your veteran community, and then relate that to nonprofit organizations, to our partners in, in local and state government. Anywhere where you are, we want to try to encourage you to participate. And in order to help you pull that in, we have our best practices. And Jack, um, uh, uh, Dave Dillamore will take it from here. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Dittimore. I'm president of the Tacoma Chapter of Veterans for Peace, uh, Navy Vietnam veteran, uh, Supply Depot Da Nang 6970, and aboard USS O'Callaghan, a destroyer escort in the Pacific uh, 70 to 71, and been a member of Veterans for Peace since about uh, 2006, as I recall. But um, my part of the talk today is talking about our mission to start with, is the best practices that Maurice mentioned already uh, was Jack Doxey's idea. He came out of uh, industry that um, instead of everyone trying to reinvent the wheel, that we would come up with a list or a menu of best practices that uh, have proven to work at different places. 
uh, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, one that I've been involved with that I brought to the group is called Quixote Village as a village of small houses. And uh, small houses have been very popular the last few years. I'm sure you've probably seen them in magazines and online. There's even uh, TV shows about uh, how to build them and where to go. Um, the big key though, uh, for a successful thing, because a lot of people don't have a lot of transportation, is to have a center house or a nearby location that has the other facilities more than, because typically a small house will only have a uh, restroom, to uh, yeah, toilet, a wash basin, and electricity. But the center house would have the showers, uh, laundry, a kitchen, uh, meeting rooms. Uh, so it makes it much more uh, habitable to have an arrangement like that. But um, I'll reinforce uh, some of the things that Maurice talked about. Um, I call it, you know, how do we, how do we got here? Uh, we're all aware of veterans with PTSD unable to uh, hold a job, office, often getting divorced, uh, living on the street, which is a terrible situation. But we're also aware of people with mental illness a lot of other populations uh, that are having trouble uh, fitting into society, uh, addictions and uh, self-medication. Um, so um, a lot of times we have spouses leaving abusive relationships uh, and sometimes children leaving an unhealthy family, um, sometimes a youth uh, going out for adventure uh, here I am, Hollywood, I'm ready to meet the world, although sometimes it doesn't work out. And unfortunately, sometimes uh, young people will get caught up in what's called human trafficking, uh, which could end up being prostitution and similar things. And the sad thing is, once they get involved, uh, they get so ashamed, they're afraid to even try to go back home. So we have a loss of a lot of uh, people that are... Uh, ended up on the street. Um, so I think it's about time for us to solve these problems. Um, and it's more than what any one chapter can do, uh, although we can build some small houses and things. Uh, for example, Seattle, I believe, has about 12,000 homeless people. Of that, probably is three or 4,000 are homeless veterans. So that many houses is a big project. And the other thing is, with the COVID crisis, I think we're starting to realize we've got a lot of big problems in our society that need to be fixed. Uh, income disparity, health care, and homelessness are some of the big ones. Uh, and they are going to have to be national solutions. Um, and because they're going to require big bucks, uh, it may have to be changed to the tax code and uh, all these Rich individuals and large corporations have been hiring accountants and things, lawyers to get away with from paying taxes. Uh, we may have to change some of those things. The other thing is, big problem is we've been trying to solve a lot of our problems in jail. Uh, a lot of us are familiar that I think about a third of the uh, jail population are people with mental illness. And a lot of times, especially in bad weather, uh, people will commit a crime just to end up in jail so they have a roof over their heads and three square meals a day. And uh, we don't, in fact, it's uh, far cheaper to uh, send people with mental health problems to a mental health facility or hospital. Um, and same thing with addictions. And the thing of it is, um, for, especially with veterans of PTSD, uh, if we just send them to an apartment complex, uh, if they get triggered and go off some night and start yelling and screaming, I'm you know, sure we're aware of that. Uh, all we're going to end up with is a neighbor dialing 911 and say, you know, this Joe here is going crazy. Get him out of here. Um, so trying to integrate people with problems into society is, is a problem. That's why I feel that if we have veterans settlements, uh, whether it's a, a circle of small houses or maybe a dormitory setting, maybe a converted motel. Uh, so when somebody has a problem, their other veterans know how to support them, will come to their aid. 
The other thing is, if there's a conference room, uh, there can be AA meetings. And instead of everybody trying to arrange their own VA appointments, uh, if you have a group of 20 or 30 veterans in one place, maybe a VA counselor can come out and have sessions with everybody in the settlement and uh, save everybody's time and become much more efficient. Um, anyway, I hope that we can reduce our spending for the military and put it back to the VA and veterans to give them um, a roof over their heads that uh, was more or less guaranteed for their service. So now it's, Maurice is going to talk a little bit more about best practices. So I'll hand it back to Maurice and thank you all for your time. Oh, and the other thing is we definitely need some more members in our homeless working group. So afterwards, uh, whether you can send us the information in the chat session or email me or any of the other uh, members or through national, maybe through Samantha, that you're interested in joining the working group, we definitely want to recruit some more members. And thanks again for your time. And here's Maurice. Thank you, Dave. And as Dave uh, described, our veteran uh, homelessness is very diverse out there. Uh, more people die of lack, lack of accessible and affordable water. Um, our veteran women have little resources and shelter programs. Um, many of the women are accessing domestic violence shelter programs. And our veteran homelessness to keep families together has even less resources. So we have made some good steps forward in uh, providing temporary housing. We can do a much better job. And some places they claim that they have ended homelessness in their local area, only to find that there is more veteran, um, more veteran homeless to follow right behind it. This is not a put your finger in the dike thing. So we have a couple of three things that we would like you to join us with into promoting and educating not only your local chapter members, but your local um, nonprofit organizations um, and your local um, uh, uh, representatives, your mayor, your city council members, that sort of thing that, that works for the city. And we're not asking you to reinvent the wheel. We're asking you to step in with people already working with their homeless organizations, nonprofits, and that sort of thing. But to talk about some of those things that we know that work. One, we need more uh, accessible affordable housing. That is something that we need. Every locale around this country has an issue in finding accessible affordable housing. So we want to get behind that issue. We want to get behind the issue of more veteran fat vouchers. We want to get behind that issue. And we can talk about more this is one of the best practices to find out what veteran fat vouchers are. We want to get behind the uh, congressional um, bill that you can find on our website. We we'll try to update on a regular basis um, that uh, provide more funding, not not only just for general uh, homelessness, but target uh, veteran homelessness, people with disabilities, our LGBT community, our transgender, our women who uh, women veterans who have been sexually abused. One of our best, one of the issues that we want you to promote to you is outreach. And because the VA is, has, is not fully staffing, nor fully funding the VA, it falls upon us, as I spoke about earlier, to look out for each other. So to that end, we have one of our best practices is an outreach program. Um, in San Diego, they have the sleeping bag, what they call the sleeping bag program. Once, once uh, a month or so, um, they partnered with um, uh, one of the sleeping bag companies and was able to go out into the community, buy uh, socks and um, um, clothing and other issues, along with sleeping bags as an immediate um, um, condition to meeting veterans where they are. More importantly than being able to buy sleeping bags and socks and hats and those sort of things and things that our homeless veterans need is water. We have more homeless people dying of dehydration than any other cause. The next reason is um, ongoing and systemic um, health care issues. This is one of the reasons we need to address that. We have substance abuse, alcohol, and mental health issues. Even if they went through all the services and programs at the VA, it is difficult to maintain sobriety or to stay clean and sober 
or mentally stable if you don't have a house. Housing is our least thing. And as Dave talked about, uh, we have possibly some of our largest population of homeless people are in our jails and our prisons. But they are coming out. So we need to make sure that they're not, they can have halfway home and so before they begin to get on the street. So our Homeless Veteran Working Group is an organization that um, um, first want to bring attention to that there are homeless people out there. Two, we need to support the services and programs that are already in existence. And also talk to veterans and outreach to find out what other services and programs need to be brought to. There's a lot of work to do. We need to work on distance. If you're interested, you can work with local neighborhood organizations to be able to pass out masks to make sure that veterans get cards to tell them where the local VA so they can get tested, where they can begin to get uh, tracing as to you live, depending on where you live, there are tent uh, communities or tiny home communities or just in your doorway. They need to know that they are not alone, that they haven't been forgotten. And they also need those necessities to be able to access to wash their hands. So we need facilities available to all these people. They need to have them in their community, uh, porta potty, hand washing, sanitizers. Those things need to be given out to the homeless. So there's a lot of work that we can contribute together and work with your um, local nonprofits and our local representatives. Um, so uh, also one of our best practices other than outreach is working with, um, as Dave was talking about, you can start your own program. In San Diego, we started a Nika's a Nika house um, with four people, all who were unemployed, started a program for homeless veteran women and children, where we were able to secure housing as landlords. Hey, that house is uh, abandoned. We have some abandoned uh, uh, homeless veteran women. How can we work with you to get a, a reasonable rent so we can get three or four women and their children in there? We did that around around the city, and we're able to get some to get put not only access to services and programs, but to connect them with their pensions, be able to get uh, uh, health care for themselves and for their children, and also be able to get trans transportation support, and also get reintegrated in learning how to live within the community. Many veterans, both male and female, have a difficult time adjusting from military service to civilian service. Just like that, it is a difficult project to work from living homeless for a period of time and rejoining the community. So there's a retraining in that. So we need to make sure that we have a lot of things in place. You can work with local areas or join our organization. We can help you work through that. Thank you. And we now we'll take questions and answers. Okay, thank you so much everyone for joining us. Again, we are so, so sorry for the tech issues that occurred. Um, we are about to go live taking some uh, live Q&A. So Dave and Maurice, if you guys want to um, unmute and turn your videos on. Um, folks, if you wanna ask questions, you can post them in the chat. Um, you can find the link to get into either the chat or the Q&A function. You can also use that function. Um, they'll be in a black bar at the bottom of your screen and you'll be able to post your questions um, via text in those two or if you would like to ask a question audibly out loud, um, if you go over to attendees, next to your name, you should have a button that you can click and it will say raise hand. And if you raise your hand, we will be able to see that and unmute you so you can ask your question out loud. All right, we've got Becky here with her hand up. You have folks ready to start, Dave and Maurice? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. All righty. I am going to unmute Becky. Becky, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi. Good. I just wanted to say good morning to Maurice because I just uh, I just uh, I had uh, long conversations with him when he visited Portland recently, and uh, I I actually hit the raise hand button by mistake. So I, I don't have a, a question in my mind, but I just know that you guys have a wealth of information. And um, yeah, if I think of a specific question, I'll come back at you. I just wanted to say good morning. Well, good morning. Can, uh, can you hear me? 
Hello? We can hear you. Oh, yes. So I want to say uh, good morning and hello, Becky. Becky, correct. I just left Portland there um, Saturday, I think. Or no, Friday. Well, anyway, I, I was just up there a couple days ago and, and, and back here in Berkeley. But um, Becky's right. We've had some long conversations talking about the range of things of homelessness and that sort of thing. And when I was there, I was very surprised that the large number of homeless people and homeless community and tents out there. And this is this just goes to show you that our homeless veterans and homelessness in general is, is all over all over everywhere. It's not just an uh, urban issue, it's a rural issue, it's the issue for out in the country. And we wanted to make sure that one of the first things we do that in our very satisfactory is it's sort of get an assessment to talk to nonprofits that governmental uh, things to find out how who's out there. We wanted to find out how many homeless people are out there, what are their needs, uh, how do we communicate with uh, our homeless veterans and get them the cars to say where their nearest health care is or how they might be able to get another health care. So we have a lot of work to do in Portland, like many of us, San Diego, New York, Chicago, so here, uh, particularly here in the Bay Area, San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley. We have a lot of uh, groups where people tend to conjugate together, and as we know, there's not a lot of chance for spaces. There's not a lot of chance to need for photo parties and be able to wash hands. We, since the stores are closed, we have to be able to look at other alternatives and get toilets and, and hand washing out of them. Because McDonald's is closed, the libraries are closed, the, all the things that they utilize to be able to access of uh, 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 bathrooms have been uh, restricted from them, have been taken from them. So we need to look at things, how we can make sure that um, women and children have a place to safely be able to use the bathroom, to be able to wash their hands, be able to get the mask. We got homeless people who are uh, since, uh, 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 trying to go to uh, a feeding locations, a food location, such as churches and other nonprofits, and standing in lines, in long lines together just to be able to access those small buildings and find the gates. We have to look at ways on how we can get separate meals out to them and partner with church organizations like they have in San Diego. So there's a lot of work to do, and um, we need to identify what's the problem. But we do that by, if you can't go out and visit uh, uh, no homeless people, then go to the non, ask for the nonprofit in your area, ask them, the, the local, um, all mayor's offices around the country or county has a veteran representative. Ask the people to represent the people what's going on in your area and how your chapter might be able to help. Yeah, thanks, Maurice. And I wanted to mention, I've been trying to uh, check the comments in the chat session and noticed, I believe it's uh, Cara Bissell of Tucson was saying that they're working on converting an abandoned motel. And uh, that's exactly the thing, you know, I was talking about in my portion of the lecture. Um, something like that is probably bigger than one chapter can do on its own. But uh, usually in most cities, there's several groups working on veterans issues and homeless issues. But, and I hate to take advantage of anybody, but, you know, with this COVID situation, there are a lot of businesses that are, hit, you know, come, you know, going out of business. Uh, and to make it work, uh, you know, maybe the uh, old motel is not paying their taxes if, you know, no one's staying there. Um, and so it's going to revert to the city or to the county. And as I was saying, I don't know if you want to get it donated just to your chapter, but uh, other groups like Catholic Social Services, we have a social group here called Rescue Mission, you know, that works with homeless issues. And uh, maybe there could be some consortium, and uh, maybe each uh, group could rehabilitate, rehabilitate one room or whatever. Uh, you know, get the washers and dryers fixed up so it's a functioning uh, society. Uh, but that's exactly the thing that we I need to work on to uh, start getting people uh, get a roof over their heads. Thanks. Any to see some other questions. Okay, we've got a, uh, a hand raised from Big Jim Brown. Uh, 
Big Jim Brown, I have given you the ability to unmute yourself. So if you want to do that and ask your question. Hi there. This is this is Jim Brown from the San Diego chapter. Hi, Maurice. So anyhow, uh, we get out uh, we get out and we pass out these uh, our sleeping bags and other stuff to them. Uh, almost, or, I mean, usually they're out out in the open somewhere, and we approach them and and we talk. To them. And pass this stuff out, but during during the COVID, we haven't been really able to go out. We're a little, we're pretty nervous about you know picking up the, the disease, seeing as how we're a bunch of seniors. So, how is that affecting other people out there? Do you have any insight on that, Dave? Um, yeah, I know every situation, every city is different. I know uh, I'm close to Seattle and of course there's a lot of stuff going up in Seattle with about 12,000 homeless, three or 4,000 veterans homeless. There's several different settlements around town. Um, but uh, some people, I know uh, one of our brethren uh, down in Portland was taking lunches uh, to a settlement from time to time. I'll take some water bottles or if I have some extra food or something I may take to uh, one of these settlements, uh, a lot of times they're easy to find. You, normally they're not visible. They're kind of off the beaten track. But uh, yeah, and the other thing is, I think a lot of people are supportive of this idea uh, because we're at the point now only 1% of our citizens uh, join the military. The other 99% feel uh, kind of guilty and a lot of sympathy for helping out veterans. So I know uh, you folks in you know, Seattle have raised quite a bit of money, uh, you know, if you, especially if you can give a talk to like a Kiwanis club or something like that, about what you're trying to do and pass the hat, a lot of people will throw in a 20 and uh, you can raise some serious money. And um, I believe they are uh, connection is with Coleman in Wichita, Kansas, to get uh, sleeping bags at a discount. Uh, so you can get a pretty good uh, project like this going. And I think you're probably aware there's homeless almost everywhere. There's biggest uh, concentration on the coast where we have a little milder weather. But uh, yeah, whatever you can do, and as I said, if you can team up with other groups, I, I think that's the best way to be effective. Another question? Well, that, I, I want to follow up on, on what you said, Dave. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hello? Oh, okay. So I want to follow up on um, um, Big Jim Brown's <laughs> um, question. Uh, how can you help? Well, I think Dave hit the key to it. Uh, here in the Bay Area, as I was doing in San Diego, many of our better peace members have been going out and, 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 and personally um, connecting and making contact with veterans. For many of us older veterans like myself and here in the Bay Area, I had to reduce my time in going out because people were following me out there who had um, other conditions. They were much older than I was <laughs> and they had three different conditions. So um, to try to work with them, I had to stop going out. But what we did do and what I did was, and you might try this too, uh, Jim, we make connections with um, nonprofit organizations who already who uh, continued their outreach, we contacted a faith-based organization who are uh, continually going out. And then the city also has a program that little stock uh, uh, sack lunches and hot meals to, uh, to um, uh, senior citizens. They have also diverted some of that effort to uh, bring in those same food, um, socks, and other necessities of, of, of women, um, sanitary issues, all those sort of things need to be taken into consideration. You can call in and ask the faith-based organizations how, how they can help. What needs do they need? Do you need people to help make sandwiches? Do you need people to do some grocery shopping? There's still a lot of you don't have to go out there specifically, but we can look for third parties for younger groups who are, are more experienced and how they can connect with better without us going there. But we can make sandwiches. We can go shopping and help. <laughs> stop in some of the gardens and then take those to the uh, local uh, charity program. They can also people working local charity, faith-based organizations, and nonprofits. So with, with just a little 
dialing around, you can find ways to step in to continue your effort without actually going face to face. That's it. Okay, we've got a question from Dan Shea. Dan, I am going to allow you to, to talk if you want to go ahead and mute yourself. <laughs> unmute, sorry. Mute. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Okay. Hello, uh, Dan. Well, uh, uh, again, I'm with uh, uh, Veterans for Peace Chapter 72 here in Portland, uh, Oregon, and uh, I wanted to first just mention that uh, uh, we do have one of our members who uh, uh, has been working with the homeless here in Portland, received about a $2,000 grant just recently to help out. Um, uh, Jenica Sharon, who was a former president uh, before me uh, of our chapter, she's been doing something that I think was pretty amazing, and that is that she just gathered, uh, first of all, just uh, making uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and taking them out into uh, the communities where she would find people and distribute them. And then that grew into uh, where uh, people were donating clothes and uh, shoes. And then she just, and more people began to, to become involved in it. So that was, that. I just wanted to recognize her for that because she's really done a terrific job. Um, but one of the things that we had here in Portland that might be a question for you both is that uh, the VA had housing vouchers. There was a certain amount of vouchers that were available to help uh, homeless vets. They were supposed to go into the community, find those people and, and give them vouchers. Well, we had a person in the housing and social work who was a whistleblower who told us about these vouchers because we were really unaware of them. And uh, one of our members, uh, uh, Chris Knight, uh, worked with another person uh, in our chapter to go up and meet with the VA administration and find out why those vouchers weren't being used. One of the things they had, the, they had it in um, uh, the person who was managing it uh, uh, was in the wrong, it was in the wrong field office. They needed somebody hired to do specifically that. That actually happened and they started outreaching and sending people into the, uh, the homeless areas to find uh, veterans and uh, uh, and distributed those vouchers. We were talking about millions of dollars that would be, or hundred thousands of dollars that were being wasted. Um, so they finally got used. Now that should have been, uh, I believe that was a national program. So I'm curious uh, how those vouchers were being used in your area. And, um, uh, and I don't know if those are continuing uh, or if they, they've underfunded that all of a sudden. So could you tell us about that? Either one of you. Well, uh, and thank you, Dan, for that question and stuff. So, yes, um, that's how you begin, by asking questions. And recognizing the problem that Dan started about <laughs> one of the best practices that, that Jack has in our best practice is how do we communicate with our local representatives and nonprofit organizations to find out how to find out how we can help. We can't help them if we ask questions. And you start out doing that. But let me explain a little bit first what a back voucher is. It's, it's not a housing voucher per se. It is a service providing uh, service. Uh, substance abuse, alcohol, mental health, uh, physical injury of some sort. Anywhere where a veteran may have difficult financial difficulty being able to keep a roof over their head. It is very similar and works pretty much like the Section 8 voucher out in the civilian uh, world. But this is a voucher that where Section 8 is Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't know directly. I was going to say, I, I don't so, know directly, but I've heard rumors about this program. But it's a combination of different things going on. But the main thing is, is a developer will go to the feds and say, you know, I want a million dollar loan because I want to build a you know high rise condo complex. And the feds will say, OK, well, here's your million dollars. No, by the way. Uh, donate or dedicate 10% of your rooms to low income. And so the developer builds his million dollar building. And of course he wants to be upscale and he, you know, he, gosh, he really doesn't want any low income people in his building. So when the building gets done, they say, gosh, we, those rooms for the low income, they didn't materialize. So it's my understanding we got vouchers floating around 
and people have been waiting for th you know three four years to use their vouchers and there's no place to use them because the, the low income housing never got built uh the the big high-rise condos got built uh for the affluent and they had their high-rise condos but there's no no housing been built for lower uh, low income that's that's my only thing i know about it and i agree it's not much well i i'm i do know about them and i am a <clears throat> i am a participant in the vast program so i i have one myself so it's just not large houses most of our housing vouchers go to mom um of um, 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 uh, apartments and or uh, uh, living some of management companies but one of the issues that we've been working on is trying to make it more uh, easy for landlords to be able to access the service and program what it's not so much the landlords are not going to the uh, government saying hey we want to get get into this program and in fact it's the reverse we are getting resistance from using the fast route so what we'll have to do was one of the campaigns that we have with our home development working group is trying to identify and work with uh, the VA and um, identifying landlords who would take the um, uh, bad stock and actually doing workshops with landlords to say, here's how you can participate in the program. Here's how you can get guaranteed funding. One of the new things that and I wanted to bring up right quickly, one of the new things we've been advocating for years since rents are going up higher and higher, it is very difficult for our homeless veterans in fact, to, to get into the uh, housing market because there's security deposit, there's one month's rent, there's many different obstacles to be able to get rehoused. So we are asking the Fabric Security and other organizations to help us with um, security deposit and those one month's rent. The, the third thing that um, um, we've been working on for years, after, I'm sorry, they, they're building a, 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 a new parking lot now. The, uh, for women, it's hard for single people to save up one month's rent and one month's security part. It inhibits people to be able to get rehoused. So what we've done is saying, hey, why don't we partner uh, veterans, uh, women veterans together, partner men veterans together. And that way we can pull the resources not only in shared rent, but also in shared um, uh, security deposits, shared one month's rent. So we can do that. It has been prohibited by the VA for many years, but we're doing a pilot project here in the Bay Area and trying to see how that works. And we're going to report to be out later this year about how that is working. But what I understand is that they're doing an extra job. So bringing together veterans and tying them together to get those bad houses and then going into the rental market is one way to alleviate that. So those, but we need to be advocating more one thing, more pointing cash out, not just once a year, but a couple times a year. So we make sure that we got adequate resources to fix the problem. The, the issue is that we've always been working behind the curve because we're not getting enough resources out there. And that is because we are not doing a good enough job and uh, doing a count. We can't do that once a year and come out with a good count of homeless people who are constantly ending the program. We need to do that at least at the very least twice a year so we can wrap our arms around what kind of resources we need. More of the tiny home, more bad spouses, um, more, more women's shelters, more uh, domestic violence shelters. We need to, uh, more family-friendly um, shelters. Usually around the country, there are single shelters, but not enough family shelters. And we're finding for veterans, our families are fastest growing homeless population. So we must begin to look at options that are take available for families, whether it's start renting uh, single room, single, uh, single housing situations, and or partner with uh, in the housing community. So we have a lot of work to do in, in this area. That's it. All right, we've got some uh, questions over there in the Q&A. Um, if you want to take any of those. Uh, we also have uh, Dwayne raising his hand. Uh, Dwayne, go ahead and unmute yourself, and then we'll move to the ones in the Q&A. So if you all have uh, questions, put them in there, or make sure you use that raise hand function. Okay, can you all hear me now? We sure can. Yep. Thank you, family. 
Uh, I'm very grateful to uh, be a part of this uh, conference or convention. And one of the issues that have been risen about um, partnering up vets is one vet will be responsible and pay his half of the rent. However, the other vet or her rent and the other vet will then um, uh, be unable to hold a job due to, due to whatever reason and can't come up with his part. So the total responsibility, even though both um, partners are on the lease, only one of them has, has money to, uh, to kick in for the rent. And so the both of them get uh, evicted and then they both have uh, uh, bad uh, uh, credit uh, spike on, on, their, on their thing and pre helps prevent them from getting uh, a rental at another time because they were evicted, even though it wasn't their fault. Can somebody speak on this? Yeah, that's, that's a bad situation. Um, I know I've been attending a PTSD support group um, and a lot of these, you know, post 9-11 veterans are young, young people uh, with not a lot of life experience. Uh, I remember one young man, he was in a situation like that, you know, had a roommate, another veteran. And uh, the other guy decided, you know, he wanted to go buy a motorcycle. So he went and bought his motorcycle. And so he didn't have any money to pay towards the rent and utilities. So this guy that was attending the support group decided he was only his only solution was to commit suicide because he couldn't come up with rent and utilities. So I said, no, 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 go talk to utilities. They'll, you know, work out a payment plan or whatever. Um, but I, you know, I don't know whether some of, of us older, you know, Vietnam era veterans can act as mentors to some of these young kids or whatever, but, uh, yeah, that's the problem with, uh, a few youthful indiscretions. Yeah. As you say, can, uh, mess up the, credit history and you know make life overall more difficult you know even now to get a job they look at your credit score so uh yeah it's definitely a problem thanks so this is maurice can you hear me yep. hello okay so this is a nationwide problem but there are solutions to this one of them as i talked about is the um, homeless <clears throat> the v all VAs around the country, no matter where you are, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, has a homeless program. What you do is, Mark, you, can, you don't have to wait. The biggest reason of one of our major uh, best practices is in addressing homelessness. And the first one we talked about is homeless prevention program. So there are a lot of programs with the bad voucher program. And even if you, you're a veteran and you don't have a bad voucher, you can go in and see if you uh, have one, or if you can apply for one. And most all veterans can, can apply for them if you have at least one year of being homeless. Be before we get to that, the VA has, along with those bad houses, comes a housing counselor. That housing counselor can help you be a support to you and I think I hear you, Mike. You're other parties in the household and develop, developing a budget or help you look for jobs. The source of cloud shares can help you if you're buying your rent. Help you if you're buying your rent. There are a lot of other organizations that I think our local chapters can distribute to uh, our, where we know veterans might be living and to those on the street. The lesson that's one reason we talked about outreach is to get them access to resources. There are resources out there. You got the um, the, the vet center. The vet center has both psychologists and people who can help you with your budget. They can help you apply for your vet doctor and get a vet doctor. The homeless program, the local uh, city hall has a local veteran uh, group of uh, uh, representatives. Contact them. They also can help you access the services and programs, both to help you make up for your rent, to keep you in your house, because uh, the mission for all of us now is how do we keep people in house? So there are a lot of support services out there, and I'll be glad to share some of those resources with you if you contact me through our um, Veterans for Peace website, my address, and contact information is there. And we'll be glad to help you uh, coordinate um, with how to keep people homeless prevention, how to 
he be in the houses and how to rapidly uh, get vouchers to be able to maintain houses. And if you're already homeless, how you can you um, re-enter the uh, housing program or re-enter uh, housing. So we have a lot of different programs, a lot of different methods to, to, to get us there. But your contact me will help you and your chapter become more better informed so that you in turn can help those who are our homeless brothers and sisters who are living on the street. Okay, it looks like Dan's got another question. Dan, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, uh, yeah, I have another question. One of the things we found uh, with some of the homeless vets uh, was that, uh, first of all, they, they didn't have any records that they were veterans. They were on the street for a long time. Uh, some lived in communities, some did not. Uh, but at the, at, uh, one of the hardest things was to, was to get them their benefits and to, to have an advocate that could somehow uh, help them get the information to prove that they were a vet, get them into the vet system, uh, because they often had uh, uh, severe uh, post-traumatic stress or even BTI uh, um, or sexual abuse, uh, any of these issues that, that can occur from uh, uh, being in the military. Um, they, they would even qualify, it wouldn't be, matter for a job, they would qualify for for uh, 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 a, a VA rating and receive funds that could actually help pay for some of the things they needed. But the main thing is they needed therapy and they needed a roof over their head. How have uh, you worked with getting the uh, people uh, uh, records uh, so that they can qualify uh, uh, their eligibility with the VA? Absolutely, and thank you for that question. That's the most excellent question, Dan. And so here, and again, here are some solutions. <clears throat> we, this is the main reason that we asked the first, <clears throat> I'm sorry, excuse me, I got something in my throat. First contact. One of the things that we want to do is with first contact, we have a lot of veterans out there who don't even have a VA card. They're not even recognized. Nor, and they don't have records. So how do we address that issue? Well, first of all, we contact our local um, um, VA or vet center. They generally have an outreach program. You have that outreach person, a uh, homeless outreach person from the VA. They can come out, meet with that veteran, find out, get their name and address and, and, and number. Uh, or you can get your local VA representative that works in the mayor's office. The mayor's office needs to have a VA rep. They have resources and outreach programs, outreach teams, uh, usually with an officer or a mental health caseworker or a nurse. They, you can get in contact with them. They, in turn, know where to find this veteran who are out there and they can interview him and be able to start addressing getting his business, get um, his, service, his services done. Once that first contact is made, you can contact the vet center. They have very good resources in how to retrieve a veteran uh, um, service, CD214, education records, um, person certificate. Uh, the vet center, um, well, not just the vet center, which is a nonprofit organization, but your county, county veteran center. They have access to all your records. They actually can pull up your DD-214 in like a day or so. I mean, not even a day, just a matter of you know, a few minutes. So you need to get the veteran in there with ID. So you can work with your homeless program, homeless and the VA work with your homeless program. They can help them get ID. So in many cities, in many rural county areas, they will pay for the um, uh, uh, state ID. And the VA hospital, once they work with you contact the, have the homeless veteran or uh, have the veteran contact the enrollment. Once he gets enrolled and they get his name, his address, and his social security number, they can pull his records up and mail him um, or, or have him to pick up a VA card. Once you have that, then you then all other services programs um, become available to you. But there is a difference between service connected and non-service connected. There is a difference between an access service and program of a Vietnam era, which get a gold card, and your uh, Afghan Iraqi veterans who only get five years of guarantee, and then have to have to buy into the system. So there's many different ways, pathways to get their service, but it all begins in contact with the vet center, the homeless representatives with the VA, the county vet center, source vouchers if there's one in your area, and also you know, all 
county and or local government has a VA representative, and they will be able to tell you uh, and or assist you in contacting veterans who are out on the street and how to connect them with their uh, not only IDs, but DD-214 and services and programs they may need. Uh, it may be health issues. It may need mental health issues. It may need to get to uh, substance abuse or alcohol program. The VA has both out, outpatient and also residential programs. So the first step is connect them to the, to the right agency. And, and just about all over the country, there's a county, local government, and or tourist depositors. You just take a little, little effort and you can get that veteran connected to certain program. We do that here in the Bay Area. We did it in San Diego on a daily basis. So I know that if those systems work, we just need support from our local chapters to have people to um, uh, identify them and then connect them with those certain programs. Again, if you want more information, please check our, our, our best practices or you can contact me, Dave, and we'll be glad to help work, work that out with you on how to to connect um, women veterans, LGBTQ, transgender, our uh, women veterans uh, with children, or even our single fathers, uh, uh, single veterans with, who are also fathers, how to get them to connect to service programs. So, so give us, come, join our organization and help us um, reconnect our, our veterans who have been lost out through uh, living on the street and get them connected and get them back in the home. May I say something? Oh. I'm, I'm listening. I don't know who it is. Um, I'd like, I'm, I'm wondering um, about women, vet, homeless women veterans. Um, they are, um, uh, statistics is, is say that they're the most rapidly increasing uh, percentage of the homeless population. And um, I'm, I'm wondering, we, I, it seems that we have a wealth of knowledge and experience among the participants here. Um, not just to mention the panelists. Um, I'm wondering if we could um, get some, we could talk for a while um, about um, best practices for helping um, women vets. Um, one that I know of that I put into the chat is Aura House in North Carolina. I spoke with them this morning um, and they are doing, um, you know, a good job of starting from absolute scratch um, to uh, creating uh, uh, a place for women veterans to live. So that, that's my request that we could talk a little bit about women veterans. And that, uh, I mean the participants as well. Thanks guys and ladies. <laughs> I would like to hear from my women veterans. I can't do it in the audience, but uh, if there are women veterans out there, <clears throat> <laughs> I would like to hear from them and what their experience is. Anyone so, are there any women veterans there? Reminder that the, the raise hand function should be um, on the bottom of the screen. Um, Instead of where I initially told you, that was my fault. I apologize. All right, we've got um, Marty. Marty, I am going to, uh, if you want to unmute yourself and go ahead. Okay, thank you. Now I have the mute unmute button. Um, <laughs> I was almost 20 years ago, and one of the one of the issues when I was in a homeless shelter was. Um, we were going through a phone, a form, sorry, and the counselor marked off a box and I said, what are you doing? And he said, oh, that's for veterans, that's not you. And I said, I am a veteran. And he, we had to tussle over whether or not I was a veteran um, and he hadn't even, even asked me. Um, so there was that problem. Um, uh yeah i recognized another female veteran at a women's shelter because she made her bed so tight that a quarter could bounce off of it um, but otherwise there was no way that i was going to know who was a vet or not um, other than surveying everybody and that didn't seem the right thing to do um, 
so I guess that that's just some of my uh, some of my experience. I don't know what else to add to it. Thanks. Uh, so Samantha. Marty, Marty, thank you. Marty, Marty is here with me. Well, she's a large state tearing up my parking lot. So I don't. So yes, that's that, that's a very serious problem uh, for a number of women. If, <coughs> in San Diego, uh, Maria Masaccio and myself went up. Were, were going out to the veteran tent. They have a winter overflow tent. It took us oh two years to be able to get women to access. The um, what was that one time all male winter overflow tent where where homeless shelters were full. They had a overflow uh, program for civilians, but the veterans also had an uh, overflow program, and they didn't let women in. So it took the year to uh, uh, to uh, get them to hire uh, female staff. It took them uh, it took a year to make sure that they were proper bathrooms and shower places that were separate. It took us a while then to identify uh, homeless women, homeless better women, which in the city of San Diego said they didn't know of it. So I said, that's impossible. I think you got feeding people. So what we did, we started identifying homeless women and we started taking them to stand down. We even had, uh, not only at the stand down, but maybe they're going around the country in your area. <laughs> <laughs> but you can get access to services, to programs and talk and get connected with other women uh, program of uh, people who are working in women program. The Catholic charity, source cloud there are a number of the vet center. There are a number of different areas uh, or the VA even to contact and say, hey, I'm a female veteran. I have housing problems. I have housing issues. What are some of the services and programs? Who do I need to be next? And how do you communicate with them? How can I apply for a vet voucher? So, you know, the, uh, how do I contact the disabled American veterans? They can help you get your uh, service uh, record, your DDT-14, and any other records you may need. The Disabled American Center is in every PA hospital center, or they are standalone, or you can find them through the county system, um, the, your, your local county uh, 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 veteran representative. So there are many different pathways to get uh, known, but we have to, a lot of these veteran women out on the outside, as Marty can talk about, don't know if there are even other veteran women out there. We have to do a much better job. That's why one of our first practices is how do we make contact? How do we get contact, first contact with our jails and our prisons on, on the street? And, and, and how do we contact these people? Because no one walks around homeless with veterans tattooed on their forehead. How do we, how do we contact them? Well, we get out there and we get to off the stocks. We get off the back front. We have a conversation. If you can't do it now in the coronavirus um, uh, thing, then you put contact information in people's tax money. When you're working with third parties, faith based organizations, you're working with a city organization that is outreaching to seniors and or homeless people. Make sure that you put resource information in some of those um, lunch tags. So eventually with contact information. So those veterans out there can find out once, how can they get a free cell phone? There are many cell phone operators. Well, I can't get in contact with anybody. Well, you can put in there information on how to get those free phones that are out at all our malls and in front of the VA and in front of the grocery stores. There are ways that they can sign up for those to get free phones. And they can try to search for them. So find a way to get information in people who are going out and connecting to them. You don't have to be there handing it. Uh, for you to better, you can do a second party who already you have to read this will. Just get them information, spread it out, make sure you get it to them, make sure they put it to Jesus, put it in those back lunches on the outside so the veterans can really see that, hey, I'm not alone. There's resources out here. So there are a lot of different ways that we can make contact without actually being physically there, but we can also do that. Um, one uh, one more thing. Um, I'm interested in putting together um, a uh, a brainstorming uh, group of uh, women vets um, about what we could do um, uh, nationally and also locally to help women veterans in particular, homeless women veterans. Sorry, I want to narrow it down to homeless women veterans. Um, 
And um, if you are interested in that, um, would you please uh, contact me? I'll put my uh, email address into the chat um, or you can put your email address into the chat and I'll start trying to put that kind of a group together. And I just want to um, say one other thing. I'm uh, quoting from a woman uh, vet uh, who put something into the chat um, that women vets are often single parents um, who have experienced MST and, uh, um, and which often leads to full-blown PTSD. Um, personally, I think that they're the same thing. Um, and so they have a really tough time um, transitioning back to civilian life. They often end up homeless. There are studies that show um, that they have a much higher chance of ending up homeless than male veterans. Okay, I'm putting my uh, email into the chat. Now I'm gonna get off and let Dave, did I think Dave Didimore has something to say. Yeah, thanks, Ed. I think we're all having a little trouble navigating here. Um, and thank you for raising women's issues. And if yeah, if you can lead a women's group, that would be wonderful. Uh, and I just put my email address in there. If people want to email me, if we want to get involved, it looks like we got a, about 25 people or so uh, tuning in today. I thought I'd mention the vet center uh, that I think I saw somebody in the Q and A mention. Um, if it's a great resource, um, VA has great uh, facilities and provides great service as far as I can tell, but there's always a little paranoia floating around. Little people have heard a story about the VA and they don't want to go to the VA, but the vet center is an alternative. They are run by contractors, I believe, you know, a separate organization. They are not run by the VA. Um, and they're usually separate locations. You might call it a storefront, you know, a smaller deal. It's not a huge VA building. And also, I think a lot of the counselors there are ex-veterans, or are veterans, um, maybe not all combat veterans, but a lot of times uh, our veterans will feel a lot more comfortable going to see a fellow veteran to talk about their problem than to going to talk to some guy that has a great college degree but he ain't been there, done that, uh, which, although I know most of them want to be helpful, but they're just diversion in some of our population. So um, I'm sure you can find vet centers if you go online. Uh, I think here in Tacoma, we've got three or four of them, and I know there's several up in Seattle. But uh, look around. They can be a great resource for our veterans. Thank you. I have another question. Uh, yeah, so it looks like Marty, you have your hand raised again. Go ahead and unmute. Yeah, I just wanted to add when you asked for women's experiences, um, when I was homeless, uh, in a place where they did offer me um, some veteran homeless shelter, uh, I eventually chose not to go in there because there was no separate space for women at that shelter. And uh, I've been through uh, service people, well, military people, and also vets, PTSD. Um, and I chose not to do that. And I want to um, just say to record it, uh, my father's PTSD was not acknowledged. <clears throat> and before service, before my service, um, I was hit with a closed fist in my face when he had a trigger about something on the news. So I've already experienced direct violence from another vet's PTSD. It just happened to be a family member at that point. Um, but I've, I've experienced lesser um, things from other vets with in the middle of a PTSD. I mean, yeah, in the middle of an episode triggered by their PTSD. So that's it. Thank you again, Marty. That's a great observation. Um, we may or may, well, statistics tell us and studies tell us that many people join the military out of family uh, uh, disruption of substance abuse, alcohol, mental health, but sexual assault, um, sexual or uh, uh, acknowledgement of a sexual orientation. People leave their 
home for a variety of reasons. They joined the military all this, uh, to, as, uh, as, as a way of an escape. And for other, and far too often, that escape turns out to be the same thing over again. The sexual abuse, the uh, mistreatment because you're an LGBTQ uh, 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 person, um, transgender, or you may be a, a racial issue, or just a woman. So they, they come back into the same situation that they were trying to escape from. Then you add on to that after service um, where they wasn't uh, listened to or heard. And it's not <coughs> unexpected, like myself, who struggles with post-traumatic stress and other mental health issues. It took me 10 years to get back to the VA. It is very difficult for women with sexual abuse who were not only ignored, but when they spoke up, were punished for it. So there's not a, 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 a uh, it's not unexpected that um, women and others who have, have uh, been abused in the military service where they sought uh, relief and escape um, to go back to the yard with the dog bitches. So that doesn't happen. So as Dave mentioned, we have the vet centers, their county centers, their source of wild care, their veterans for peace, <laughs> who, 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 who can, you can contact and say, hey, as a touchdown, to say, hey, we have women veterans, we have this issue, and we need to find a way to uh, adapt and uh, address those issues. Um, just like what Marty was saying when I was talking about the San Diego trying to get women into 20 years, they have been ignored and not allowed into an overflow shelter and left our most vulnerable, better women out in the cold while sheltering men. That was ridiculous. Then we have to find a way that we could have separate borders, a, a, a safe space to play, and be able to use the bathroom. So once we identify the problem, the solutions are there, and better for peace, and our chapter members have both associate women, uh, associate women members, we have veteran women members, we can make those contacts with, with other services for them. So it's about the, um, um, the um, non-traditional um, uh, organizations such as the Catholic Church. There are many different ways to address that issue. Women, um, the VA is not always welcoming, even though they have a lot of bells and whistles. They have not made it easy for veteran women or the LGBT community. Matter of fact, in the Bay Area, they just now, November, passed out where they have services program for the LGBT community. That's unacceptable. So women veterans, along with others, we can partner with um, our associates and other members to let them know first that they're not alone and that there are certain programs that actually work for them out there that put them in, that will put them in a space and place that is both safe, healthy, and are able to receive the benefits that they so richly deserve and more importantly earn. All right, folks, we got a little less than uh, 15 minutes left. Make sure that you are either posting your questions over in that Q&A um, in the chat, or feel free to raise your hand and ask the question out loud. Samantha, this is uh, Jack Doxey. Could uh, I answer a little bit of D.D. Donovan's question concerning uh, female homeless? Of course, go ahead. Uh, yes, well, you know, <clears throat> Our, our particular work, work group, we, we realize that uh, uh, many women leave in the military, they need to help, um, they need help making a transition to <clears throat> civilian life. Uh, not only are they dealing with possible mental health issues, such as uh, we know post-traumatic stress disorder, but uh, many are missing that team support that they had in the military. Many need help learning the skills needed to function in the civilian world, especially in light of our current situation of high unemployment and, and cutbacks in social safety nets. Now, uh, uh, earlier we talked about trying to uh, put down and have a written order trail of some of the successes that we've had helping uh, the homeless. And we have this booklet that hopefully Samantha will help people get that out to them. But you know, much of what has been saying, said today 
in a sense, has gone up into the ethers. And we maybe some of the participants will walk away and say, those are some wonderful ideas and thoughts that we've heard. But uh, how can we ca capture those, really? They've, as I said, gone up into the ethers and might not return. Well, uh, the booklet, uh, we have put together 17 uh, best practices. And what they, the way we have structured it is to talk a little bit about the history of the particular help that we're giving, uh, how we, uh, how if you're interested, you can go about and introduce a NAT into uh, your particular chapter or your city. And then above and beyond that, uh, if you need additional help, a contact person, they yeah, can you speak to. For example, talking about <clears throat> the help for uh, uh, homeless female veterans, um, the best practice number two is entitled Providing Female Veterans with Ongoing Support to Acquire and Maintain Permanent Housing. Um, in, in San Diego, there uh, was a, a program called the Amicus Program where they tried to fill that need and did an absolutely wonderful job of taking care of uh, homeless female veterans. But they concentrated greatly on those uh, homeless female veterans that had families and were out in the streets by themselves. They, they had a tremendous need for help. Uh, our organization, the Homeless Veterans Work Group, took one woman who was in New York City. She was a veteran, uh, she was homeless, and she had three children. She um, hooked up with a gentleman that was not nice to her. Periodically, he beat her up and threatened to kill her. Uh, what we did was we brought that person into from uh, New York under a kind of a secret pact, so to speak, so that he could not travel and find her and kill her. We brought her into San Diego and we were successful in getting her into uh, the Amicus program where they concentrate solely on female uh, uh, veterans who have families. Now, there's a crying out need for this. In fact, uh, at the time, the Amicus program was the only program, uh, the, the, the next closest one to helping the female veterans, I believe was up in Los Angeles. So there's still a tremendous need to help female veterans. But back to the booklet, uh, if you're interested in uh, getting the booklet, we have now 17 best practices that leave a written order trail, so to speak, of how you can take and seize a best practice that has been proven. These are not anecdotal stories. These are, uh, these are practices that have proven to be uh, successful, and we put them down on paper. So that if, you know, there is a chapter in Bismarck, North Dakota, and uh, they have a need for instance, to uh, help the female veterans, they can go into that specific best practice, get the information, and it's like taking the module, pulling it out, and plugging it in. And what you do is you telescope the learning process down so that uh, you don't have to go through all the errors. Part and parcel of the explanation of these best practices what are some of the things that we did wrong and how can you avoid them? So um, hopefully, DD, that answered part of your question. Thank you, Jack. There's also, a, a, and I'm only reading what they say, the cat a couple of times, so, and it could pops up and go so fast, but one of the things they talk about women safety and access to the VA. And I just wanted to add that veterans for peace and our uh, veterans can help you with that. Veteran women can be together, like all safety programs, better together than going facing it alone. We can make ourselves available. 
the needs of, of homeless better women or any better women and or, or house better women and access to the VA. Once you go in there together, you go in there with power. And it's not as it's much more difficult to um, turn away a couple of people or address one better women's issue um, together than by themselves. So I always said, and I do this with my homeless better men. Many of them are unable to get communication skills, but not very good. So I always encourage them, and I try to go myself to talk to them if I can, with them to help them get their VA card, to help them understand what the forms are. And don't ever forget that you can have access to the VA with the patient advocate. The patient advocate there is a good resource to lobby on your behalf. Sometimes if you can't communicate for yourself, the patient advocate can help you navigate the large VA institutional system and be an advocate directly for you. I've found, I've worked on the VA and did access to VA around this country, and I found those patient advocates to be very much involved in supporting veterans, whether it be women, people LGBT, whatever the veteran is, I found around this country that the patient advocate in the VA is very helpful. So that is another touchdown. And also, if you're able to go with another veteran to the VA, so it is you'll get a lot better results and people don't feel alone and ask them for what they're, how to get their needs met. All right, we're coming up on the end of our time, folks. Um, if you have one last question and you wanna raise your hand, go ahead and do that. Um, otherwise, uh, let's give it a little bit to ask folks to submit their, submit their questions um, in the, in the Q&A or the chat or raise your hand. Um, otherwise, um, any last commentary from the, the Homeless Veterans Working Group folks? Thank you all so much for being our panelists today. Thank you. Yeah, and thank I you to all the audience out there. We go, this is not the, I just want to say this is not the end. Please contact us and we want to please join our organization and please contact us if you have further questions. This is just the beginning. This is not the end of addressing homeless issues. Please contact us and let's keep this conversation going to make sure that we get uh, homeless veterans off the street and back in the house safe and accessible and affordable house. And now this is Dee Dee speaking. Um, I, I, uh, I'd like to develop a, a list of a, a sort of a resource data bank of everybody who is actually doing work with homeless veterans, whether they're part of VFP or, or not. Um, and again, my email address is in the chat. And if you would send me uh, your contact info, I'd really appreciate that. That would help us a whole a lot spread the knowledge around the United States. Thanks for attending this workshop. Yeah, and this Absolutely. is Dave. I, I want to thank everyone for participating today. It is encouraging to see that different people in different parts of the country are doing things on their own, getting some things started. Uh, it's pretty just pretty much just a handful of us in the working group. Uh, we really do need some more members to be a, a good active uh, working group. Uh, so we would like to get some participations. We normally just have uh, meetings every month or two uh, on conference call or Zoom. Uh, so you don't really want to use a lot of your time, but we really want to keep track about what other chapters, and as Dee Dee says, what other organizations are doing, because it's it's obviously a huge problem. Um, so it's something we all want to work on together. But again, thanks for your time today. All right, thanks again, folks. Make sure that you fill out that form uh, in that chat. Uh, it will uh, get your contact information so we can make sure to pass that on to the Homeless Veterans Working Group. We also have um, that best practices guide that they um, have put together that is amazing. Uh, there's a link to the Google Drive and it's also downloadable on that agenda entry on the convention website where it says session materials. Um, so make sure that you have uh, access to that as well. And thank you again to all of you for being here today, um, to our participants and our attendees. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. Have a great day, everyone. And thank, and thank you, Samantha, for the most excellent work that you're doing and putting together this workshop and uh, also the whole program. So thank you, Samantha, for all your work. You, you make this very painful. <laughs>
Thanks, Maurice. And thank you all for being um, so, so patient with the tech difficulties that we had earlier. Uh, we really appreciate that. So have a good day, everyone.